I hope you know from experience that there is nothing quite as special as a good friend. A good friend is one that will always listen to you, whether you are in a good mood or a bad mood. A friend is someone who will understand what's going on in your life and will meet you where you are. A good friend is one that will pick you up when you've fallen down. Friends have this uh, ability to transcend time. I, I had this experience a few weeks ago, and I was having a bad day, and I connected with my former college roommate on uh, Facebook, and we hadn't talked to each other, we hadn't seen each other for mm, 25, 30 years. It's been a long time. I know some of you can't believe I'm that old, but... <laughs> Many of you have no trouble believing I'm that old. <laughs> um, but, but we haven't seen each other for a long time. He lives now in, uh, I think it's North Carolina. And he picked up from the email that I was having a bad day. He sent me a note and he said, can I call you? And I said, absolutely. And my friend Kim, we called him Wally and there's really no reason to tell you why. Um, <coughs> Kim's been a counselor for a number of years, so he called me up and that night we talked for a good hour. And the thing that amazed me was that from the very beginning of the conversation, there was no lag time. We just jumped right into it. That we, we were friends, and we didn't have to uh, do a lot of chit-chat. It was right to it. And you know some of those friends, don't you? You don't see them for a long time, some family members and stuff. You, you, you don't see for years. But when you get together, it's, it's as if you have never been apart. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, the friendship that we want to talk about today is not the same kind of friendship that we think of today a lot of times. We, we think of friendships in terms of Facebook. I have, you know, a thousand friends. No, nah, you don't really. Um, the truth is you've got all these people who are friendly towards you or people who really want to snoop on what's going on in your life, and so they've <laughs> sent your friend request. And those are still people that you need to be very guarded with. And if you're not, you're going to wish you had been. We're talking about friends that are deeper. Um, the lack of friendship is a problem. One author writes this. Our individualism and our wealth have allowed us to minimize our contact with others to our detriment. This problem of friendlessness exists even in our churches. In the friendless American male, Larry Richards is reported as saying that in church, we sit together and sing together and greet one another cheerily as we leave at the end of the service. We do all these things, sometimes for years, without forming any real personal Christian relationship. Our words often seem superficial. The church, therefore, becomes a place where Christians live alone together. Wow, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Where Christians live alone together together. That's not the way God designed us. God designed us to help each other. So what we want to look at today is, is a number of things about friendship. The first thing I want to talk about is, is what is a friend? And we've got several verses here that I want you to see. What is a friend? We turn to Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? Proverbs 17, 17. A friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. The point is that um, your family's supposed to care for you. That's their job. You know, family's supposed to be loyal. You say, well, they're family. We have to love them. Your friend is a person who chooses to love you, who determines that they are going to be loyal to you in spite of what maybe you want to do. Um, a true friend is somebody to whom you can, you can vent and, and you, you won't be discarded. You know, some days we're just not in a very good mood. Some days we're crabby. Okay, sometimes I'm crabby. I don't know about you. Maybe you're always happy. Some of you I know aren't. But um, a friend is somebody who gets that and lets you vent and still loves you. And so a friend is somebody who is loyal. They, they see beyond our actions of the day, and they understand our heart. A friend is someone who tells you the truth, even if it hurts. 
I got several verses here. Um, Proverbs 27, 6 is, a, uh, is the first one. Let me get to it here. 27, 6 says this. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses. Hmm. Proverbs um, 27, 17 says... As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And 2426 says, pardon me, an honest answer is like a kiss of friendship. Now, a friend is a person who has earned the right to say things to you. They have proved their loyalty to you so much that now they care more about your growth than they care about your ego. Now get that. A true friend is somebody who cares more for the way that you are growing in Christ than they do about whether or not you feel good about everything in your life. If they see you doing something destructive, something stupid, if they see you going in the wrong direction, a true friend is going to take you aside and show you that. A true friend is one that you can say to them, please help me to see the things in my own life that I don't see. Help me to see those things that are keeping me from a deeper relationship with Christ. Please help me to see that. The truth is, we can, um, we can exist without other people. We can function without other people but we can't grow without other people. We need other people to help us grow. You know, as iron sharpens iron, we need to help each other grow. Listen to this quote from um, Mr. Ortland, Ray Ortland. When iron sharpens iron, it creates friction. When a friend wounds you, it hurts. So do you see? There is a difference between hurting someone and harming someone. There's a difference between someone being loved and someone feeling loved. Jesus loved everyone well, and some people felt hurt. They were not harmed by him. They were loved by him, but they felt hurt. The truth is, a friend will inevitably hurt you with words that are respectful, true, and blunt. If you will receive it, you will grow in wisdom. Hmm. Now, this isn't an invitation to start blasting away at all your friends and pointing out every little thing. You know, there are those people who will correct every misspoken word. They will correct every fact that you get wrong. They will be, and those people aren't friends. They're just a pain in the neck, aren't they? I mean, just, oh, geez, I, I just don't want to say anything around you because I'm going to get clobbered. So that's not what we're looking for. The, uh, a true friend is somebody who has earned the right by their loyalty to speak to you. Think about it this way. Um, two people can say exactly the same thing to you. Somebody comes up to you and says, boy, that shirt or that top really doesn't flatter you. Now, the one person you might get pretty upset about and say, who asked you? You know, I don't particularly like the way you dress either. Just shut up, would you? I'm not trying to please you. And you get all upset because this person isn't your friend. And you don't want them sticking their nose in your business. But your friend who says, boy, you know, that, that top really doesn't look very good. You say, really? Why? It just doesn't flatter you. It just, it just doesn't work. And because it's your friend, you will listen to that and you go, maybe I better change if it's your friend. See, it, the difference here is that a friend is a person who has proved their loyalty to you. And they will do this again and again, and they will point out things to you that you need to see. For example, they will point out to you when you are justifying wrong behavior and say, <laughs> you know, all the talk you're doing here, but it's still wrong. They will note when you are moving into a, a relationship that's inappropriate. Do you really... Do you really think you should be involved with that person in this setting? When you seem to be compromising your faith, they'll point out when you're neglecting your family, when you've become obsessed with something and lost perspective, 
when you are spending recklessly, when you are thinking about doing something foolish, what we're told is a person like that is like gold, aren't they? Because those people care more about you than they care about your feelings. And now you ask yourself, how many of those people do I really have in my life? Not many, do you? Not many friends like we're being talked about here. So how do friendships go wrong? Well, Proverbs gives us several ideas. Proverbs 25, verses 18 and 19, we read this. Telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Putting confidence in an unreliable person in times of trouble is like shooting, chewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot. Pretty good images, aren't they? And so the first thing he says is, is when we lie about each other. And, and, and you know sometimes we misrepresent each other all the time, but when it's a friend, it hurts more, doesn't it? When a friend lies about you, when a friend misrepresents you, it feels much more like a betrayal. Why? Because you know that they know your heart. You know that they should know better. And it feels like a wound that's much deeper. And when that happens, it can ruin a friendship. And so honoring our friends on a continual basis is very important. We want somebody we can depend on. In uh, Proverbs 17, verse 9, we read this. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Friendships dissolve when we're unwilling to forgive. We all need to forgive. We all need that. We all need to, to let go of some of the things that other people do to us because they're not meaning it. Everybody has a bad day, and if we let that bitterness continue to grow, it can ruin families, it can ruin friends, it can destroy us. And so we need to learn how to forgive. We can't be um, unrealistic in our expectations of our friend. Chapter 25, verse 17. I love this verse. It says, don't visit your neighbors too often or you will wear out your welcome. <laughs> Um, what's it, Ben Franklin has said, a, a guest like fish begins to stink after three days. <laughs> There's something to that, isn't it? If, if you're one of those people who is always um, showing up at your friend's house at dinner time, yeah, if you had some of those people, they just, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was dinner time. Would you like to stay? Sure! <laughs> you know, if they do that over and over again, you're beginning to say, you know, Here's, here's something creepy that happens sometimes. You, you've been away for a while, and the moment you step into your home, the phone rings. From the same person every time. Isn't that creepy to you? I find it really creepy. Why are you spying on my house? Why are you keeping track of me? Why are you stalking me? So, so it's saying don't overdo it. Don't be overly intrusive. Don't be obnoxious, because if you're obnoxious, you know what's going to happen? These people are going to see your name on the caller ID, and they're not going to answer the phone. I'll be honest with you. I've got some people on my phone that all I have on it is do not answer. I don't even know who they are anymore. It just pops up and says do not answer. So, so if you can never get a hold of me, hmm, you know, <laughs> there may be a reason for that. Okay. We should be careful of being overly sensitive. Chapter 18, verse 9, a lazy person is as bad as someone who destroys things. Is that right? No? What is the correct verse, Kevin? And a, oh, 19. Okay, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. If we are overly sensitive, if, if every offense becomes a reason to fight, our friendship isn't going to survive. Over in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about conflict in the church, and one of the things he says is, isn't it better sometimes to be offended? Isn't it better just to absorb the hurt? Why not rather be hurt 
than to ruin a friendship over something. Let me give you an example. Let's say you and your friend planned to go to a concert or something, and, and you were all excited, and you went and you got the tickets, and you, you bought them, and you're really excited about going, and at the last minute, your friend says, I can't go. I'm sorry. They don't offer to pay for the ticket. You're a little ticked. You planned all this, and you were really looking forward to it, and now you're mad. Now you're disappointed, but you've elevated it to the point of being mad, and now you just won't let it go. Every time you see them, you're thinking, they owe me $40. And Paul would say, come on, is your friendship really worth only $40? Isn't it better to just shrug that off and to just go on and realize that, okay, these things happen. And the truth is, you may do it to your friends sometime. So how do we fix damaged relationships? So I think the Bible gives us a couple of things. In chapter 20, verse 22, we read this. Don't say, I will get even for this wrong. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. Oh, that's hard, isn't it? Let go. Let go. Let God mediate the problem. Step back and just let it go. Um, understand that in the end, God is going to weigh all things and if your friend was wrong, God will correct them. And if you were wrong, God's going to correct you. Sometimes we need to just forgive. We need to, um, to go to them and, and try to reconcile the relationship. And I, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, you know, why should I go to them? Because I'm the one that's offended. Why should I go to them and repair this relationship? Because, well, they should come to me. Let me ask you a question. What if your friend is thinking the same thing about you? You're at this stalemate. Both of you are waiting for the other to do something. A true friend cares about the relationship enough to go and say, we got a problem, let's talk about it. And things can get better. Chapter 28, verse 13, we read these words. Well, maybe... 28.13 says this. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Now, of course, that's not always the case. There are some people who will beat you up forever over things that you've done. And let's be honest, none of us likes to confess our sin. We would rather explain it. We would rather uh, justify it. We'd rather rationalize it. We'd rather blame somebody else for our mistakes. But if we want to salvage a friendship, there's nothing better than to go up to somebody and say, I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm sorry. What I did was offensive. It was rude. It was painful. All I can do is ask you to forgive me. Now, my experience has been that people can be wonderfully gracious in those situations. Because most people only want to know that you understand that you've hurt them. And so if, if we will just go and we will say, you know, I, I know I shared a secret that I shouldn't have, or, or I know that I let you down here, and I am so sorry, you mean way more to me than this, and all I can do is fall on my sword and say, forgive me, please. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, I know you say, well, what about the, the other person? What, you know, they've done some wrong things. Why don't they... Um, apologize to me. There's a very simple principle here. You are responsible only for what you do. Before the Lord, you are responsible for what God wants you to do. You're not responsible for what the other person does. And so we go and we acknowledge our fault, and if the other person doesn't acknowledge any fault, there's really nothing you can do about it. But you will have been right before the Lord and you will be blessed because of it. Friendships need to be cared for. And uh, they are so precious that, you know, we, we polish our trinkets, we oil things, we change the oil in our car, at least you better. Um, we put gas in our car. You, you do all that kind of stuff. And sometimes we don't give any attention to our friendships. And they are way more valuable than anything we own. There's one more verse that I want to take you to, and it's chapter 18, verse 24. And um, it says, there are friends 
who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. I really like the more literal translation, which says that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And the reason that I like that is that it reminds me that the best friend we can have in the world is Jesus. You want somebody who's loyal? Hmm. There's nobody more loyal than Christ. You want somebody who will always be there for you? That's Jesus. You want somebody who has proved his love to you? That's Jesus. The Bible tells us that we can have a relationship with him. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus is the perfect friend. In a sense, when Jesus came into the world, to take a Facebook analogy, Jesus was sending us a, prayer re uh, a friend request. He was saying, can I be your friend? So I have to ask you, have you entered into that kind of relationship with Jesus? See, I, I, I hope you have some best friends in life. I, I really do. But none of those friends can compare to Christ. He's always with you. He cares for you more than you can imagine. He's committed to you and he has done for you what no one else can do. He calls you to respond to his friend request. So embrace him as your savior. Confess him as your Lord. Confess your sin and receive the forgiveness and transforming love that comes from him. See, we forget that friendship is God's idea. God designed us to be friends. God gave us each other so that we could help each other grow. And, and it always irritates me when I hear people say, well, you know, I don't really care about Jesus. I'm, I'm going to go to hell because that's where all my friends are going to be. Now, first of all, that's got to be one of the saddest things anybody could ever say. Really? All your friends are going to be in hell? Well, you've got some work to do. But the whole notion is, is irresponsible. The idea is I'm going to go to hell and we're just going to have this big party because all my friends are going to be there. Don't you understand that hell is the absence of all God's blessings, the absence of his favor, which means every good and perfect gift will be absent in hell. There will be no friendships in hell. Because that's a gift from God. There will be no joy. There will be no laughter. Because these are gifts from God. And once you eliminate him, you eliminate all his blessings. So what a dumb thing to say. Hell is a desperate place where we are desperately alone and abandoned. So it, it behooves us, if we're going to be good friends, the best thing we can do is lead our friends to Jesus. That's the only way we're going to be able to spend eternity enjoying them. It's the only way. I have had the wonderful privilege these last months of experiencing the joys of real friendship. I know better than ever, um, I've heard people say this all the time, say you just... Never know what friendships are like until you're in a crisis. And I've found that that's true. These people love you when you don't even love yourself. They tell you the uh, honest problems that they see in your life. And they stand with you even when you're not that fun to be around. I have discovered what a priceless treasure these people are. And I take this opportunity to give you a feeble thank you. I've also learned much about the friend who sticks closer than a brother. What a friend we have in Jesus, huh? He will never leave us. He always focuses on our potential rather than our failures. He's determined to help us be the best that we can be. He's provided us a love and a grace that we will never deserve. He listens he understands. He patiently instructs. When we stumble, his hand is always there to help us up. He's the best friend we could know. If you want to know what a good friend looks like, study the life of Jesus. 
If you need a friend you can trust, turn to him. And in those times when you need somebody who is flesh and blood, and, and we all do on occasion, keep your eyes open. It may surprise you who God sends your way. It may surprise you who your friends really are. So my prayer is that God will help us to develop friendships and also to become good and faithful friends and that we might lead all of our friends to meet him. Let's pray together. Father, there are times in all of our lives where what we need more than anything is a physical presence that represents you in our lives. And you've given us friends to accomplish that task. Lord, we've taken our friends for granted. Help us this day to, um, to recognize them, to thank God for them, to cherish them. Father, we pray that you would help us to be better friends. We get so wrapped up in our lives sometimes that we don't have time, we say, to be the kind of friend that we sometimes desperately long for. So help us, Father. Help us in this church to develop friendships that will last so that we don't have to be desperately alone together but that we might come into this place and find a strength that comes from friendship and from the work of your spirit in our lives. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.